Welcome to the latest installment of the Castlewood webinar series. This is Deanna James. I'm our Director of Marketing and Referral Relations for Castlewood. We are so glad that you are here and have joined us today. Uh, we had a computer crash in the middle of getting on this morning, so we're just a few minutes late, but we are on another computer and ready to go. So um, Jennifer Edwards, who is a therapist at our Monarch Cove location in Monterey, California, is going to be speaking today on, on reclaiming the body and body work um, in eating disorder recovery. And so I just want a, a couple of housekeeping things for everybody to know. Um, first of all, if you have any questions or you need anything throughout the webinar, please feel free to use the questions feature. Do not raise your hand or use that hand raising system. Just go to the questions feature, type a question, and we'll be happy to respond. And we will have a time at the end for question and answer. Also, I will be sending out Jen's PowerPoint after the webinar. So for everybody who is in attendance today, you will get an email with the uh, PowerPoint attached, and then also we will also you'll get an automated email from GoToWebinar with a link to an evaluation, and that evaluation will um, allow you to get your certificate. We'll send out our CEU certificates usually about a week after. We give people about a week to fill out their evaluations and get everything done, and then we'll send you the CEU certificate. If for some reason you do not get an automated email with the evaluation link. Um, you can always just uh, send us an email and we'll be happy to send it to you. So without further ado, here is Jennifer Edwards. Thank you so much, Deanna. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really excited to be sharing with all of you. So yeah, today's topic is entitled Reclaiming the Body. And we're going to be exploring some ways to begin to build some somatic resources um, when working with people with eating disorders. And I just want to take a moment and say a little bit about the title, Reclaiming the Body. Um, in that, I feel really, really strongly uh, about the, that process of really stepping back into an embodied place and and reclaiming the body for so many of our clients with eating disorders, the body becomes something that is disowned, that is objectified, that is the enemy. And part of the recovery process to me, actually, you know, the majority of the recovery process to me is really coming to a place where that view of the disowned, the objectified, the body as enemy is shifted and the person really begins to reclaim the body, thus reclaiming oneself in a new, more enlivened, more human way. Um, and I'm really excited to share how I've been able to uh, understand and explore ways of doing that with people with eating disorders specifically. So I really just want to make it clear that um, the framework that I'm coming from today is largely influenced by sensory motor psychotherapy. I uh, have been trained in the level one uh, sensory motor psychotherapy, which focuses on uh, processing trauma, actually. And then level two moves into uh, healing developmental wounds and attachment wounds. What I really, really love about sensory motor psychotherapy uh, as you see the definition there, is that it's a body-oriented talking therapy and it integrates both uh, the verbal and the body at all times. Um, the, the way and the process of sensory motor psychotherapy really brings both body and verbal along every step of the way. So if you're working with someone and they suddenly, or not so suddenly, maybe gradually, become disconnected from what's happening in their body. Sensory motor would really dictate that you pause there, understand what happened to cause that disconnect, and work in that zone until both body and both mind are on board, online, active, and engaged. Um, to me, you know, I 
feel that that's great for anyone, but specifically for people with eating disorders, you know, to really come from a place where the body is on the journey the whole way of healing uh, is really, really crucial. And the body's giving us so much information, has so many ex stories, has so many experiences held within it that to, re to leave the body out of the room when, uh, when doing therapy you know, is really limiting the information that, that is happening and that, uh, and that awareness that can be had. So really big reason why I come from this framework of sensory motor today. Um, so in order to keep both the body and the mind engaged on the healing journey, uh, sensory motor teaches one how to monitor and see through the lens of window of tolerance. And so I'm strong your attention to this chart here. And the idea is that the space in between um, in, in between these two lines is the optimal arousal zone of the window of tolerance. Um, this is where we want to be functioning ourselves, and this is where we want to keep our clients within this range. When we go outside of the range into hyperarousal up here, um, it's too much arousal to integrate. The, the person is emotionally reactive, hypervigilance, um, maybe experiencing intrusive memories from you know, post-traumatic stress, um, is in very obsessive, cyclical, cognitive processing, um, and tension, shaking, very ungrounded. You know, just generally that person that's really jittery, if you, you know, has the heightened startle response, if a door closes, the person jumps, um, it's the person that's always scanning the room, the person that's very aware that there's three minutes left of the session and wants to be able to do, you know, everything possible within those three minutes, um, just hyper aware, hyper aroused physiologically. And then below the bottom line of of the window of tolerance is hypoarousal. Um, and so that's someone that's experiencing too little arousal to integrate information. Um, this experience, you know, this can be uh, manifested as someone pretty flat, um, kind of blah, numbed out, collapsed, uh, often seemingly depressed. Uh, the, depression as a hypo-aroused state um, where the person is too, too distant from their own body sensations, their own understanding of how uh, they're experiencing the world uh, to, really, to really get activated by it. Um, sometimes people describe feeling like there's a fog around them, that they could be moving through a busy street, um, but really not taking in any of that energy, just still feel very numb to it all. So the goal is to, one, help clients get into their optimal arousal zone, their window of tolerance, um, remain in there, understand the limits of that zone. Uh, so if we can help the person become optimally, you know, engaged and regulated within that zone, then helping them understand what are the things that are going to push them outside of those limits into being very, very, very um, anxious and hyper aroused or what's going to push them into a state where they're going to say give up and say like screw it and disappear and isolate into their apartment um, and zone out to TV for hours on end in a state of hypo arousal. Um, and then also a goal would be to expand that window of tolerance um, 
So the larger that window is, the more of life experiences a person can navigate um, with a you know, healthy response and remaining reasonably regulated and engaged in what's happening. So those are the goals of, of when you're viewing uh, clients through this lens of where are they in their window of tolerance and what can I do to help. When, this, when the idea of the window of tolerance was introduced to me, then I started to think in terms of how the eating disorder functions in, in relationship to the window of tolerance. Um, when we think about eating disorder functions, some of the common psychological functions are that it you know, it provides a sense of control. A person is able, with anorexia, to say no to something. You know, saying no to the food generalizes to saying no to other things. Similarly, with binge eating, saying yes, um, food is something that they can say yes to and receive and enjoy and find pleasure in. Um, eating disorders can provide a sense of identity. They can help cope with traumatic experiences and post-traumatic stress symptoms. Uh, they can, eating disorders can be, you know, a way to get attention and a way to get taken care of and nurtured. So those are some of the psychological functions that are commonly referred to when we think about eating disorders. I want to shift that a little bit to maybe considering how the eating disorder functions solely to, to regulate body-based experiences, to regulate those, uh, to regulate physiological arousal states, body cues, body awareness, and body connection. So with the first, the physiological arousal states, going back to the window of tolerance, you know, the idea being that uh, the eating disorder actually functions to push a person into the window of tolerance for a little bit so that they can function in life. And then, you know, maybe a consequence is that it also, you know, brings them back down into these other other states of hyper or hypo arousal that aren't so optimal. For example, with binge eating, oftentimes uh, someone has a, a craving to binge and, and feels a sense of excitement around that and you know looks forward to the food that they're going to be taking in and as they're eating really enjoying that and really you know it, it gets them aroused um, their taste buds around, their excitement levels a little up so they can move from that hypoaroused state temporarily into maybe more of a, a window of tolerance where they're, they're actually engaged more in life through the food. They're engaged in the experience of enjoying the food. However, that, that could be a bit short-lived and the result being after the binge they crash back down into hypoarousal, feeling numb, <laughs> feeling flat um, and and just kind of zoned out. And both of those states could be what the client is looking for. They're looking for the rush of excitement and then looking for that that level out where they get to be numb and not experience things that they don't want to be experiencing. So that's one example of how the eating disorder behavior can serve to just regulate those physiological states. Another example is with anorexia. Uh, if a person is more inclined to be hyper aroused, anorexia, when, when a person um, is denying themselves food, they might initially see a, a spike in energy that allows them to feel like they can function and maybe they really long for that hypervigilance because they're scared not to be. Uh, and eventually with prolonged starvation, 
they're, they become cut off from their body, and so that constant anxiousness, anxiety, heart rate, tension that they feel in their body, they're disconnected from, and they, they don't have to feel the, the, the downside of what constantly being hypervigilant means for the body, and thus brings them into a window of tolerance where maybe for a period of time they can actually function in life without, um, without being constantly haunted by this hyperarousal that they can't regulate. So the eating disorder, the restriction, the denial of food cuts them off from that experience so that they can go about their daily life. Also with uh, regulating body-based experiences, um, so I was just speaking to the physiological arousal states. Also, it can also, uh, the eating disorder can also function to, again, regulate the person's connection with their body cues, body awareness in general, body connection. Um, I put hunger fullness down as an example of body cue. Um, most people with eating disorders develop somewhat of a phobia of experiencing hunger and or fullness. And so the eating disorder can function to prevent them from feeling whichever that they're, they're phobic of. Um, if someone is, has a propensity for binge eating, uh, the constant binging fills them with that sense of fullness and prevents them from having to experience the physiological state of hunger that makes them so uncomfortable. Vice versa, if someone uh, chooses to restrict, oftentimes eventually their hunger cues diminish and the person doesn't have to experience that hunger that scares them so much. So, with the idea that the eating disorder can function as a way to regulate uh, physiological arousal states and body connection uh, within those window of tolerance levels, then the question becomes, how does one then increase the window of tolerance? And from sensory motor psychotherapy's perspective, the way you do that is through somatic resources. And what I really, really love about the idea of somatic resources is that with, for a person with an eating disorder, so much focus is on how the body is bad, how the body betrayed the person, how the body's not good enough, how it's damaged, uh, how it's limiting, and this really requires a person to shift from the body as the enemy to the body as a resource, somatic resources or, or felt body resources that come from the experience of, of the body. So in acknowledging that there are somatic resources within you, you are shifting into a state of understanding and considering that the body isn't just the enemy, that it actually is very resourceful and is giving you a lot of information and has a lot to offer at any given point in time. One of the ways the sensory motor one of the core like building blocks of sensory motor and understanding what what one's experience is at a given point in time is through the core organizers. Core organizers are on the screen as follows, five sense perception, um, so sight, sound, taste, touch, and um, blanking on the fifth one. <laughs> um, but you know, those five senses. Um, and then inner body sensations. Uh, so what you're experiencing in your body, like tension, 
relaxation, numbness, um, you know, like churning, um, tingling, that sort of thing. Body movement, so any movement that's happening in your body, if internally, externally, or just noticing impulses for movement. Um, thoughts, so cognitions, thoughts, emotions, and spirituality. And so according to sensory motor, um, these core organizers are the way in which at any given point in time we are organizing our experience. So when we tune into these things, we can become mindful of our experience at a given point in time. So I'm actually going to just take you through this. And this is one of the first skills that I, uh, that I teach clients that I have here because it is just a simple way to begin to create mindfulness of their experience, both externally, internally, through the body. So I'm going to assume that everyone's geared up to do some experiential stuff because that's what we body-based people like to do. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and just guide you through a very brief uh, mindfulness exercise and then follow up with some you know, further thoughts on it. So just take a moment and starting with five sense perception, just look around the room you're in or if you're outside, fortunately. Um, just really take a look at, notice everything in the room. Notice if there's a nice smell in the room. Just notice if you're hearing anything other than my voice, and just notice what it's like to hear my voice. Just notice if there's any taste in your mouth, I have some funky after coffee taste going on. Just notice what's going on there. And then last I notice, uh, Notice what you're in contact with kinesthetically. Are you sitting in a comfy chair or not so much? Are your feet on the floor? Are they crossed? Do you have comfortable clothes on today? Just notice kinesthetically what your body's coming into contact with. And then you can take it uh, one step further if you're up for it and you can leave your eyes open or if you focus inwardly better with a lower gaze or your eyes shut, go ahead and do that. And begin to notice inner body sensations. So again, notice those areas that are tense, any muscles that are tense or any aches. Notice any parts of your body that are really relaxed and comfortable. Just be aware of any, any areas of your body that you actually can't really connect with at all. Any work down there and there's a, a void. And just acknowledging what's going on with the body. Then go ahead and, and notice any movement happening. You know, if you're multitasking right now and we got the arms going and writing stuff. Or if your foot's tapping because you're, you know, you got some energy going on in your foot. Just notice any movement happening or any impulse to move. Maybe you have to go to the bathroom and so your legs really want to take you out and, and run and get that taken care of. Just 
Notice any thoughts that are happening. Just acknowledge them. Maybe take a moment to discover if there are things that are running through your mind repeatedly, if they're just kind of arbitrary. If there are lots of them or if they just kind of float on through. Then, if you're up for it, go ahead and notice any emotions that are lingering for you today. Now, you don't have to dive into any of them, but just noticing what's there. Maybe hanging out with whatever emotions are there for a little bit, if you don't feel up for it. You don't have to go there. And then lastly, connecting with whatever sense of spirituality means to you, whether it be uh, God, whether it be a um, general universal entity, um, a larger, you know, a sense of just a larger connection to the world around you. Whatever that sense of spirituality means to you, if it's okay for you today, just just allow yourself to, to hang out with that sense and experience it, that for a few moments. And when you're ready, just bringing your awareness back more to a focus of those sensory experiences, feeling, again, where your body's kinesthetically in contact with your environment. Bring your sense of hearing back, taking a nice breath smelling what's going on around you, tuning back into the taste in your mouth, and eventually, if you did choose to close your eyes, just bring that awareness, that eyesight, back into the external environment slowly. And taking a look around, taking it all in. And so as I said, that is that mindfulness, uh, you know, that guide of just going through the core organizers is one of the first things that I facilitate with my clients and then also have them practice on their own, have them write down each of the core organizers and, and practice checking in with them on a daily basis. I know it seems really simple. Um, but for this journey back into the body, for people with eating disorders, simple is best. The slower we go, the more simple it is, the, the better. Um, because of that small window of tolerance for being connected to the body, um, people with eating disorders really need these small, clear, doable ways of of being mindful and building that capacity to be mindful of the body in particular. So, as I said, when working with a client, um, to follow up on this, I would have them write down each of the core organizers and instruct them to, to check in with those core organizers on a daily basis doesn't have to be, you know, when they're really, really uh, triggered by something. It can just be like literally any moment during the day. Uh, it's just the practice of pausing 
and bringing that mindfulness and awareness into what's going on for them. Uh, for some people, if they're struggling, I actually have them do that daily check-in and then journal about it, write what they, what, what they uh, connected with in each of the areas so that they really do take the time to acknowledge it and make it, make it uh, known. And then I have them bring it into session. That's just a, an accountability thing, really. Um, and then if, if someone is really uh, being able to utilize this, then I may ask them to start doing this check-in before and after meals. Um, again, building that mindfulness now, not only of you know, what's going on for them at some random time during the day, but getting more specific um, what's going on for you before and after each meal? Can you tolerate being aware of what happens for you before and after a meal? Um, and that, to me, is a start of really being able to be present with food in a different way than in a way that they might not necessarily be too motivated for because it seems intolerable. So building that that way to be aware in a way that's not going to send them over the edge. One last thing that I'll say about this specific uh, experiential is, and you can do this yourself as I just walked you through it, if you could notice the areas that you felt were really affined with, that were really easy for you to connect with, uh, so perhaps it was really, really easy for you to notice what sensations were happening in the body or to notice uh, thoughts that were circling around. Um, and maybe it wasn't so easy for you to connect with emotions that were happening in your body. And what's interesting about starting to notice those areas where you're affined and areas where you, you struggle to connect is that it, it gives you clues regarding how you generally are affined with organizing yourself self in the world. So, um, for example, like I said, if it's really easy for you to connect with the sensations happening in your body, it's likely that as you move through the world, um, you're, you're also, you use those sensations as a big source of information about how you're making sense of the world at a given point in time. If you're very aware of the sensations that are happening in different experiences through your day, um, that that has an impact on how you're making sense of a situation at a given time, which can be really great. And also, it might, um, and this is what I do with clients, is that it, I also then offer, OK, well, if that's a really easy way for you to make sense of the world, how can you start bringing in these other areas to help you make sense of the world? Um, you know. Would it be okay for you to build up your capacity to be connected with your emotions so that when you're in an experience, you can acknowledge what's happening for you emotionally and let that also influence how you're making sense of this moment instead of just thoughts that come in. So it's a building block for being able to expand your horizons and expand your understanding of, of the world. OK. So again, because I'm a body-based experiential person, and um, I'm just imagining that everyone's super on board with doing experientials and that you're stoked to be, to be doing them. So that's, that's the image that I'm drawing up in my head. <laughs> it's really odd to not be able to see people. Um, 
I'm going to ask you to, if you're up for it, to follow along with another experiential. And again, this is um, this is something that I would do with a client with an eating disorder. Um, and I'm going to take you through this as I would take it uh, take a client through this, and then just speak to some of the things that I did uh, specifically to facilitate this process. And um, yeah, and, and hope you're able to to follow along and and stay engaged. So, what I want to ask everyone to do is to focus on a thought that um, that you feel like it would be really useful for you to believe, and that you actually do have some connection to believing for yourself. Um, so examples would be, you know, I can do this, um, I'm brilliant, um, I can really persist through difficult things. And once you have that thought, whatever it may be, go ahead and say it out loud or write it on a piece of paper and read it. And then take a moment and notice where it resonates in your body. Like, Where does it feel like that thought comes from? So when I say, I am capable, I really can feel it a bit in my spine. My spine gets a little activated. And so wherever, wherever that thought feels like it exists in your body, just notice that. Focus on that area of your body and just hang out there. Hang out in that experience in that area of your body and notice what it feels like. Is it tingly? Is it strong? Is it gentle? Soft? And just keep the thought in mind and then allow yourself to just hang in, hang out in the space in your body where that thought lives. And I mentioned, you know, that maybe there's strength in there. Notice that there's an emotion. Is there hope in hope attached to this thought? Is there compassion? Is there happiness? And let that inform what it feels like to experience that thought in that area of your body. Does that change anything about it? Just enhance what's already there. And then if it would be okay, just allow that body sensation to move into other parts of the body. So if I'm feeling the energy in my spine, I'm just going to let that same feeling spread up into my shoulders. And maybe there's a movement that helps that happen. And just keep allowing it to move and expand into the body, to different parts of the body from that original place 
and just notice where it wants to move. Maybe it's okay for it to move into one part of the body and not the other. And just wherever it's allowed to move, wherever it feels right for it to move into, just let that happen. Again, continuing to notice that body experience of how the energy of that thought can just grow inside the body. And if it's okay, you know, especially if you're alone in your office right now, <laughs> see if that if that wants to turn into a larger movement or a posture and really bring it fully active into the body. Um, you know, maybe maybe there's a swaying, maybe there's just a really a gesture or a posture that really feels like it's the manifestation of that energy of that part of that thought. And just really let that happen in the body the body show you what it's like to live that thought, to fully experience and live that thought, just for these moments. And as you allow that to happen, just know that you kind of mentally snapshot that feeling, that movement, that posture, and know that that doing that movement or just saying that thought and bringing it back into the body, it can bring you right back to this experience so that there's access to this state whenever you want and whenever you need it. And then go ahead and gradually bring yourself back into more of an external awareness. Cueing back into the screen, into the room. Shifting, stretching, adjusting as needed. Maybe trying to maintain whatever, uh, whatever nice experience you had and dropping any not so nice experience you had from that. And I'm just going to take a few moments and, and speak to uh, a few of the things that I did. One is that I did start with a thought. Um, it's safer for clients with eating disorders who are pretty phobic of their body to start with a thought. Um, it's just more distance in their brain and their mind. Um, it can also be useful to use an image, um, you know, even if the person has, like physically has a photo or an image from a magazine or a collage they did that helps them feel good to even hold that in front of them and then use that as the springboard. Um, also, if a person has a strong spiritual connection, that's a great place to start to um, experience a resource, um, you know, if they have that that feeling of their soul um, or, you know, light within them, and just start with that, that and and develop a a thought from from there. You know, like I am, I'm good, I am light, I have light, that sort of thing. Um, throughout, I do offer a, a menu of options. Um, for people that are, are not used to being connected with their body, that being too open-ended is overwhelming. <laughs> so um, asking, you know, like, oh, does it spread to your arms? Is it, does it sway? Does it stay still? Um, and giving them some options so then they can choose the one that fits. Um, or, you know, it can spark them to understand what you're asking 
and then um, and then it's easier for them to articulate what's happening or what feels right to them. Um, you want to bring the resource into the body as much as possible. So the thought was the springboard that we used um, and tried to facilitate bringing that thought into a body experience that's a resourceful body experience um, and allowing that to happen as much as possible so and into as much of the body as possible. So if they started with feeling it in their pinky finger um, and maybe that's all they could tolerate, um, but you know, can that move into the rest of the hand, would that be okay? Can that grow into the arm? And really just allowing room for that to, to spread as much as possible into as much of the bodies as possible. Um, and then this is an interesting one to just allow, um, to try and keep them within this resource place in this positive experience for 30 seconds. 30 seconds really helps actually start to facilitate um, some brain chemistry changes and, and start to solidify new pathways um, in the brain. So keeping them there for 30 seconds is really beneficial for them to be able to really um, feel and um, and kind of neuroscience, like brain chemistry-wise, mark that as something that they can go back to. Uh, quickly, some potential stuck points, and maybe uh, you out there, as you were following along, experienced these. One, the response of, I can't feel it in my body. So the springboard is there, and um, they say they can't feel it in their body anywhere. Um, usually I don't accept this, so I push them and say, like, it can be a point zero 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 percent part of you, but it's in there somewhere. Let's find it. Where is it? Um, or I might say, oh, well, is it in your mind? Is it in your brain? You know, and acknowledging that that is part of your body. Um, and so just starting from there and then, again, trying to let that grow and move down into, you know, can that now, can you experience that in your, you know, around your throat or in your face and move it down to the shoulders and see how far into the more core rooted body it can go. It won't move into the rest of my body. Um, sometimes uh, we're also right now building a tolerance for something pleasurable. Um, so, again, for the client that has it in their pinky finger, I might gently encourage them to, to allow fear or blocks that come up to just say, okay, drop that, just focus on the great sensation in your pinky. Would it be okay for it to move into the rest of your hand? And if they say no, then you acknowledge that as that that's okay. So let's just hang out with it in your pinky finger for today, you know, and that's building that tolerance. Maybe the next time it'll be able to move into more of the body. Um, and then lastly, a big one is that they don't necessarily want to always put the resource into movement. Not necessary, but um, certainly can enhance things. Um, so again, I just push a little bit and see if there are ways that they can challenge themselves to put a little bit of movement in there, see if there are any blocks, and try and really focus on the resource and not the block. Um, or, or maybe it's stillness that's really powerful for them, and so just really embracing that sensation of stillness and, and making that very, very um, experienced in the body, what it feels like to be you know, stable, to be still, to be whatever. Okay, I'll quickly go through these and then I know we have to get to questions. Um, so once we work through and facilitate uh, having a somatic resource from springboarded from a thought, I have, again, them practice daily with that. 
Um, I also bookend sessions with that, so I'll have them bring up the resource and then um, before they leave, um, have them feel the resource. So if we go into a more dark place, um, bring them up out of it and have them leave my room feeling a bit empowered. Um, and then I also experiment with them uh, around meals and food, um, you know, accessing those resources throughout meal time. Um, and lastly, there's a specific application of um, food, and basically you would help the person access the resource in the same way, and then literally bring food into the room and see what happens. Uh, notice what they can articulate happens when food is in play can they maintain connection to the resource or not. Most of the time they can't and then there's a process of, okay, how can this food be here and you still remain connected to the resources that help you get through life and are going to help you get through this meal. Um, and so helping the person through that process, then again they have this skill set to be able to take with them um, when they are needing to uh, show up for their meal plan. So that is all that I have for today. Thank you so much for listening, and I look forward to people's questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jen, for a wonderful webinar. And I do have some questions from some people. If you have questions, just a reminder, use the questions feature of your GoToWebinar screen. It's a box, and you can just type in questions, and we will be happy to read those. Um, so first of all, uh, questions about sharing the slides. Yes, as I announced at the beginning of the webinar, I will be emailing out the slides after the fact. That will be a personal email for me. And then you will also get a, an automated email from GoToMeeting slash GoToWebinar from Citrix that will have a link to an evaluation for you to fill out to obtain CEUs. So now um, here are some questions that we had. Um, it says, you talked about binging going from hypo arousal to window of tolerance. Mm -hmm. I see it uh, as going from a window of um, a hypo arousal state to then being a hyper arousal state after uh, a binge. The person describes himself or herself as numb. Um, both as they binge and after. So I'd say the binge is moving from the window into hypo to avoid feelings. Please comment. I, uh, I think that can absolutely be the case. I think that's one of the great, um, the great things about using the lens of the window of tolerance. It is so, it's one of the ways that um, people really are individuals. And so when a person, you know, a person may be able to get through their day functioning relatively in their window of tolerance, you know, maybe even something triggers them to be a bit hyper engaged and then the binging comes in to, to really bring them down. Again, like the person who asked the question to say to, to numb out because they can't tolerate that, that little nudge even up towards hyper arousal. Um, so I think that, I think the eating disorder can come in in many different ways um, to, and in many individualized uh, manners to bring a person into, out of, or maintain their tolerance levels for sure. Okay, great. Thank you. And then um, we had a question about um, what exactly do you mean by resource? Um, sorry if that's too vague is what they said or ba too basic, but <laughs> what do you mean by resource? Um, so resource being um, specifically in this case, uh, somatic experiences in the body, body-based experiences that help a person feel more capable, um, more empowered, better, a positive ex body-based experience. Um, and it can be very like simple as in uh, 
you know, like that feeling that I can do it, or that feeling of like, oh, I really have the ability to love. Um, it can also be more, uh, you know, like less emotionally connected. So a somatic resource can be that feeling that the body gives you of, um, oh, something is not, is happening here that's not quite right, you know, that kind of pit in the stomach, and then gives you the signal to leave a situation. Um, so it's both a way that a person can feel like empowered and capable in the world, and then a somatic resource is also um, the viewing the information that the body has given you a, in a given point in time to keep yourself safe as just as that is not good or bad, but as a, a resource and information that we should pay attention to and react to and acknowledge. I hope that is clear. No, that's really helpful, I think. And then um, there was a question about um, when you um, are measuring arousal in the window of tolerance, is it just a subjective report or is it some kind of biomeasure? Um, it is subjective and then, so, you know, I'm definitely, when I'm with the person, you know, noticing physical signs of hypo or hyperarousal. Um, and then also a big part of assessing whether or not a person is in their window of tolerance is if they can uh, reflect on and articulate their both their body-based experience and you know and be engaged with you at the same time so that idea of you know if a person is sitting there with their legs shaking um, out of control I might say do you notice your leg shaking and when they say if they say no I know they're out of their window of tolerance when I draw their attention to it and they say like oh yes now I do I've brought them a bit closer into the window of tolerance and then would keep them speaking to things that could help them be able to get to a place where maybe their leg wouldn't have to be shaking out of control um, and having them verbally speak to what happens when we make each adjustment you know can you put your foot on the floor okay yes what happens there and all of those questions and their ability to respond lets me know that they're getting closer and closer within their window of tolerance and then when their body kind of regulates a bit then I also know that they're that the the body and the mind are coming coming closer together uh, another question is um, what is your neuroscience data to support your claim of brain change imaging studies? To support my claim? I think, I think somewhere in there, I think someone maybe had misheard you or something, but that you had said that, um, that there were some brain change imaging studies that uh, would show uh, that um, I guess maybe maybe you were referring to sensory motor, or I'm not sure actually. And so what I would invite this person to do specifically is go ahead and email Jen specifically. Her email was at the beginning of this on this first slide, and we'll send out her email because I'm I'm not sure what you're referencing. Do you know what she's referencing, Jen? Um, well, I don't remember referring to that, but I do know that sensory motor psychotherapy is based on uh, on neuroscience studies and specifically uh, Bessel van der Kolk in addition to other other researchers out there. Um, so you're also welcome to go to the sensory motor website and get a closer look at the science that they reference there. Great, great. And then just one final um, oh I th the, the person has said that you said 30 seconds to change the brain. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, gotcha. That is, I, I was a little scared of that because it that does come from sensory motor and it is from research that they found to be true. Um, so I would be more than happy to get the specific uh, site reference for where that comes from. I can say experientially that um, 
that it does make a difference and feels a little weird to hang out there for 30 seconds. But, uh, but I thought it was worth mentioning because, uh, because it is, it can be difficult to have people hang out there and because, you know, the general notion is the more the better a person can be in that experience, the, the more likely the brain is able to adjust and really shift. Yeah, and you know, I know that Sensory Motor has a lot of research on their website that's cited, so you're welcome to go view that. And um, and then um, finally, um, one other question was: um, So are you saying that they go back to the feeling that they had that helped them relax when food is brought in? And I'm not exactly sure what this. Again, this is like a little bit of a confusing question, so sorry about that. But um, when you're talking about um, trying to move them into their window of tolerance, I think is what she's referencing. Yeah, I, I literally want them to, or I'm trying to facilitate them being able to access that relax, if it's relaxed that they experience that relaxed state or that hopeful state or that strong state when food is present. So, you know, if, um, if you work with people with eating disorders, oftentimes, you probably have encountered that they're literally one person when you're with them in session and then if you see them with food um, they could really like be completely different uh, affectively, behaviorally, um, physically, you know their posture, physiologically and so the more that if I take the time in, in a session to really help them build a resource, um, you know, like relaxation as that person referenced, then I would ten, then try and take that next step of, okay, how can you access that relaxation as mealtime happens, as that food is present? So it might be for a moment, you know, sitting with the meal in front of, of the client and then helping them try to visualize and reconnect to that relaxation resource and just have it be there when they're sitting in front of the food. Then as they take a bite of the food, you know, it may they may start to shift out of that connection with the relaxation. And so then it's literally step by step, bite by bite, how can they stay connected to that resource that um, that helps them feel, you know, feel better feel capable. Okay, so I hope that that kind of helped clarify some people's questions um, and um, lots of um, uh, lots of thank yous and appreciate it and wonderful and all of that. So thank you so much, Jen. That was wonderful. And thank you. It was really fun. Yeah, and so again, you know, we'll just follow up and we will send everybody a link to an evaluation and we will also send out the PowerPoint slides. Jen's going to email those to me and I'll get them out to everyone. And if you need anything further, please feel free to contact us at Castle Water Monarch Cove anytime. We want to be a resource for you in the community in regards to eating disorder treatment. So thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Thank you.